you're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is November 15, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Patient Management Conference, a case of aspirin sensitivity. Our presenter is Dr. Hannah Newhouse. She's an allergy immunology fellow in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, Pulmonary, and Sleep Medicine at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. All right. Morning, everybody. Um, This is um, our second hour of COLA. Um, Today is November 15, 2021. Um, and um, I will be doing our patient management conference this morning. This was this was my exciting thing of my presentation. So, <laughs> okay. So, um, so to start our case, um, we uh, have a forty-year-old female. Um, she presented to um, our clinic um, for um, evaluation of medication allergy. Um, and she has a um, history significant for joint pain um, and has had multiple um, medication reactions to her, to her um, medications for her pain. So she has had um, concern for reactions to Ketorolac, um, ibuprofen, as well as um, diclofenac. So um, regarding her um, reactions, so her reaction to Ketorolac was um, 11 years ago. Um, it was shortly after she had a C-section, and um, she did receive IV ketorolac at that point. Um, she doesn't recall a lot of the timeline between when she received the um, medication as well and between that and when she started to have symptoms. Um, but she does recall um, falling of her lips um, that was noticeable by um, her medical provider. Um, And then she also felt um, scratchy throat and had a hoarse voice. Um, So for her symptoms, she was given IV Benadryl, and then her symptoms resolved within 20 minutes. And she has since avoided all Ketorolac. So regarding her um, reaction to ibuprofen, tolerated ibuprofen several times prior to prior to um, this particular event, um, but it was nine years ago, and it, about two years after her reaction to the Ketorolac, she took ibuprofen following a gallbladder removal. And she says she had these kind of nonspecific symptoms, including feeling warm and weird, um, that started about an hour after ingestion of the ibuprofen. But then shortly after that followed, um, she had itching around her mouth, um, itchy throat, itchy ears, there was no additional symptoms, no lip swelling, there was no rash, nausea, vomiting, or um, physical breathing, no strider. Um, so again, she took Benadryl, and her symptoms was within an hour, but she did not require any other interventions. And she has since avoided ibuprofen. With her reaction to the diclofenac, um, so this was last year when she tried to take this for her joint pain. So she initially was prescribed oral diclofenac, and she says that within 45 minutes of that ingestion, uh, she again developed a hoarse voice. Um, she had um, throat itching and itching around her mouth. She took Benadryl and then had resolution of her symptoms all within about an hour. She was then transitioned to topical diclofenac for on her knees, um, and then she says that um, she had shortly after, um, shortly after taking the or applying the topical diclofenac, she did develop kind of itching around her mouth, throat itching, um, and the hoarse voice again. Um, from that was from topical diclofenac, and then she also says she had kind of two itchy bumps. She did not have photos of that. Um, on her leg um, where the diclofenac was applied. She took Benadryl and then um, her symptoms did resolve again within an hour. And she has avoided diclofenac um, in all forms since that time. So just a little bit more um, detail. She uh, never had 
um, any ER visits for this. She's never required epinephrine for any of her reactions. Um, she's never had any wheezing, feeding, nausea, vomiting, syncope, loss of bowel or bladder. Um, she has been able to take acetaminophen okay without any issues. She previously did tolerate aspirin, um, which is a strong for the initial reaction, but she denies having had it since her reactions. Um, and she has never tried Celecox or any other active COX-2 inhibitor. Um, she does not have a history of asthma and does not have a history of rhinosinusitis, um, anosmia, or no nasal polyps. And she also does not have chronic urticaria. So her physical exam was fairly unremarkable. Um, she had normal vitals. She just had some scant drainage on exam with, um, with kind of pink non edematous turbinates, but there were no um, visible nasal polyps. So um, as you may have guessed, that's going to lead us into our talk today um, about NSAID hypersensitivity reactions. So just a little bit of history to start off. Um, so in 1902, um, the very first hypersensitivity reaction to aspirin was noted um, by Hirschberg. Um, and then in 1968, it was further characterized by Samter. Um, so you can see Dr. Dr. Max Samter over here um, and Beers. And um, so they described an aspirin triad or Samter's triad of aspirin hypersensitivity, asthma, and nasal polyposis. And then in 1976, um, the proposed mechanism of these, um, of the, these particular NSAID uh, reactions was described by um, Cezel Stegazaklik. I can not say that correctly, but, um, and um, he described what's called the cyclooxygenase theory, which we're going to go into a little bit more. So, um, so the proposed classification system for the NSAID hypersensitivity reactions, um, and they did that based on the cross-reactivity with other NSAIDs and NSAID classes, as well as the presence of underlying disease, um, which remain um, big questions for us today um, uh, when we are seeing these patients. Um, the YACI um, further um, clarified these classifications into acute versus delayed, just adding an extra extra layer there. So overall, 1 to 2 percent of the general population are affected by some form of NSAID hypersensitivity, but it does tend to be um, women more than men by ratio of 3 to 2. So talking about um, classification a little bit more. So some of the, um, well, as kind of what was proposed by Sezalik and Stevenson, um, as well as kind of um, added on by the Yaki for a classification of these reactions. Um, so the, the big main questions to ask when we are seeing these patients um, include, um, in addition to the full um, drug allergy history as we typically obtain, um, but is the acute versus delayed reaction, are the reactions from multiple NSAIDs um, from different classes of NSAIDs, or is it from a single NSAID or an NSAID class? And then the presence of any underlying disease, such as asthma, rhinosinusitis, nasal polyposis, um, and chronic urticaria, are any of those present? So as you can see over here on the right, um, this is the different NSAID classifications here. Um, so these are the um, chemical kind of structures of them that we think about when we are trying to differentiate the um, reactions from a single class versus from multiple classes. So you have your salicylic acid derivatives, your paraaminophenol, your propionic acid derivatives, acetic acid derivatives, phenolic, enolic acid derivatives, um, phenamic acid derivatives, and your selective COX-2 inhibitors. So this is kind of the um, one big chart to refer to when you're seeing these patients. So um, when we have been asking about cross-reactivity with um, NSAID classes, when we see these patients, so um, we kind of break these up into different um, different types of NSAID reactions um, to clarify it further. So of the cross-reactive types so that when symptoms are produced by multiple classes of NSAIDs, then um, 
types of these include your aspirin exasperation, exacerbated respiratory disease, AERD, um, or kind of also sometimes called NERD, and said exacerbated respiratory disease. And I have included the, um, the classifications um, based on types. Um, that is sometimes um, sometimes um, are organized that way on up to date and others various um, various organizations. So AERD or NERD is type one, and then type two is NSAID exacerbated. And then type 3 is the NSAID-induced urticarian angioedema. And then type 4 is kind of a, actually kind of a class of its own until it's kind of further specified. Um, but we'll talk about that um, a little bit more. And then in the non cross reactive type, so when the patients have reactions to only a single NSAID or class of NSAIDs, um, these include type 5 and type 6 or your NSAID, single NSAID-induced urticarian angioedema and um, single incident induced anaphylaxis. And then a little bit different, you have your delayed type hypersensitivity to a single NSAID, um, and uh, that um, is, doesn't have a typical type um, differentiation, but that is included in the classification as well. So this just is meant to help to um, clarify a little bit or to kind of go through um, just some of the questions you asked. So if you have a patient, um, just reiterating, you know, if you have a patient that comes in with a reaction to an NSAID, um, you know, obviously we ask our typical questions on drug allergy, but then um, also you want to ask, was it, what is their underlying disease? Um, and then have they had any cross-reaction to additional chemical groups of NSAIDs? Um, so, you know, asking about if they have asthma, um, or nasal polyposis, um, and if they do, then um, you ask about kind of cross-reactions, and then that'll kind of take you to NERD or AERD, um, and then if they have urticaria, angioedema, or anaphylaxis, um, helping to differentiate, um, do they have an underlying history of urticaria and angioedema, or do they, are they otherwise previously healthy? And um, we'll go into all these classifications a little bit more, but this figure was to help to just reiterate um, those specific questions about the pattern, like these, as well as the um, cross-reactivity. Um, so going on to pathogenesis. So um, for these acute reactions to NSAIDs, so for the cross-reactive type, when they do have the reactions to multiple classes of NSAIDs, then this is sometimes called pseudoallergic. And this is non-IgE mediated reaction. And this is where the cyclooxygenase hypothesis comes in because symptoms are more so related or exacerbated by COX-1 inhibition. Um, so particularly your aspirin, your naproxen, and um, and then your non cross reactive type, so your single NSAID or class of NSAIDs, so this is more likely to be allergic um, and is more likely to be true IgE mediated reactions. And then delayed is a little bit different, as, um, as we know. Where, um, so this is, um, again, not cross reactive, so single NSAID induced, um, delayed, and um, typically we think of them as more being T cell mediated reactions. So, um, going into the um, cyclooxygenase hypothesis, um, so um, we may recognize, you may recognize this image from our board review book, um, but um, baseline, these patients actually have. Okay, so now we're going to go into um, each of the different categories a little bit. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease, or NERD, or AERD, um, as, um, as we sometimes call it. So um, talk about that. So for um, NERD or AERD, so as we kind of talked about before, this is technically called type 1 um, as well. 
And with these patients, they have, um, so a little bit of background, 1% to 3% of children um, with asthma have AERD or NERD. Um, so a little bit less common in children, um, more common in adults, so 7% of total adult asthma patients but um, significantly higher among those with severe asthma, so 14% with severe asthma. Um, so they present with um, acute dyspnea from bronchoconstriction. Um, they can get rhinorrhea, um, nasal congestion, um, and this can usually start um, within the 30-minute up to three-hour um, following instant ingestion. Um, so um, it does take, um, can sometimes take a few hours to actually start to, um, to present itself. Um, and so this is in patients that do have underlying asthma. So um, in addition to the airway symptoms, upper and lower airway symptoms, they can have ocular symptoms, they can have cutaneous symptoms as well, as well as GI symptoms, which kind of has been a little bit newer development. Um, so, um, as we talked about before, it's called the aspirin or Samter's triad when you have this. So, so you have your chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, you have your moderate to severe asthma, and then you have your hypersensitivity reactions to, um, that's supposed to say, say aspirin, not aspiring, um, and cross-reactive NSAIDs. So um, as far as timeline goes, they usually have their upper airway symptoms first, so chronic rhinosinusitis. Um, which usually precedes asthma, um, and then finally NSAID hypersensitivity comes last. Um, notably, these patients are at increased risk for near-fatal asthma or have high-risk asthma. So um, they do, as far as kind of pathogenesis, we talked a little bit about that with the cyclooxygenase pathway. Um, but they do also have just um, a significant underlying eosinophilic inflammation that's present in both the upper and lower airway that also drives this disease process. And um, so as we kind of talked about before, they do have, um, in addition to having decreased PGE2 um, production um, with the COX inhibition, um, they also have just de a local deficiency of PGE2 um, within the nasal and bronchial epithelium and actually in the nasal polyps themselves. Um, and so that's just even further exacerbated by um, the COX-1 inhibition. And um, again, just, clear, just to um, drive home a little bit further, this occurs in um, more than one um, NSAID or um, structurally um, related NSAID group. So um, for diagnosis of AERD, um, so um, all, the biggest thing is going to be history and then plus or minus an aspirin challenge typically. Um, and so in patients that don't necessarily have that clear history of reaction to multiple NSAIDs um, or structurally unrelated NSAIDs, um, then um, a challenge is necessary to confirm that diagnosis. There are multiple different methods of challenge. So um, oral aspirin challenges are um, the most common, and, um, and but you can have um, IV challenges, you can have inhalational challenges that are um, more so present in Europe and Asia, um, not in the United States. And then you can have nasal um, challenges as well with um, intranasal installation of um, acetyl salicylic acid or um, catorolac nasal sprays. And then during that, they measure your nasal inspiratory flow and your symptom scores. Um, but that can be more present and um, that can be done in patients that have um, mostly kind of upper airway nasal symptoms um, with the AARD or if their asthma is just too severe to be able to do um, an aspirin challenge. Um, but um, it is a little bit less sensitive and so typically a negative nasal challenge is um, followed by an oral challenge. So as we kind of talked about, oral challenge um, to aspirin is considered the gold, gold standard um, for diagnosis of AERD. Um, and um, so this is done in a supervised setting. Um, you have your equipment that's necessary for resuscitation. And then you have your asthma um, needs to be stable with an FEV grade one greater than 70% predicted. So you want to make sure everything is stable beforehand. Um, for challenges specifically, not so much desensitizations, which we'll talk about, but for challenges, you want to stop your asthma medications 
um, at um, the kind of indicated intervals. So with your sabas, you stop them usually six hours beforehand. Um, some protocols say eight, but six is usually um, usually um, uh, re at least required. And then for labas, you want to stop them 24 hours in advance. And then for your antihistamines, again, stopping that um, in anywhere from three to seven days, depending on that antihistamine that's used. And so there are various challenge protocols that um, kind of exist. Um, so usually start around the 20 to 40 milligrams, so pretty small dose of um, aspirin. And then you double at each time interval, which um, depending on the protocol can range from um, one and a half hours in between up to three. And then you reach your max dose of 325 milligram tab um, at that final step for a cumulative dose of 500 to 600 milligrams of aspirin. So um, during that challenge, you measure the FEV1 um, before each dose of aspirin is given and um, otherwise every 30 to 90 minutes. And if um, the FEV1 drops by 20% of baseline or if they have just unequivocal profuse um, upper airway symptoms like urinary congestion, then that's considered a positive aspirin challenge. If you reach your cumulative dose, of 500 to 600 milligrams of aspirin, but you don't ever get a decrease in your FEV1 of at least 15% or any nasal or ocular symptoms, then that is considered negative. Otherwise, in diagnosis, so basal activation tests um, have been um, studied for um, aspirin hypersensitivity, but um, nothing is kind of um, standardized or um, available as of yet. And then um, because it's not IgE-mediated process, it's related to your cyclooxygenase inhibition, or excuse me, cyclooxygenase um, pathway, um, then um, you um, don't do skin prick testing or your serum-specific IgE testing for this. So for management of AERD or NERD, um, so primarily for, um, for asthma, um, it can be severe. Um, significantly severe asthma and often requires that high dose ICS and LABAs and then um, biologics. Some do require daily low dose oral steroids, um, but otherwise management is just um, kind of typical per, per, um, per the guidelines. So with your um, anti-leukotrienes like your um, Montelicast or Zephyrolucast, Siluton, um, then um, they do have been shown to kind of decrease your nasal symptoms and improve FEV1 um, by overall decreasing of your upper and lower airway um, inflammation. But interestingly, there's not necessarily any further improvement in your NSAID-sensitive um, patients versus your NSAID-insensitive patients or non-reactive patients, um, which is interesting because you would think that um, the NSAID-sensitive um, folks would get more benefit from, from that. Um, otherwise, um, you um, continue to treat your chronic rhinosinusitis or nasal polyposis as well um, with the goal of decreasing nasal inflammation, preventing any further polyp formation. Um, and so this um, is typically involves some sort of long-term intranasal steroid, whether it's steroid rinses or steroid sprays. Um, sometimes um, you can um, do a systemic steroid course to help to shrink those polyps, which is called a medical polypectomy. And then um, you can do surgical polypectomy, aspirin desensitization, as well as um, biologics, which the approved ones now are um, dupilumab, omolizumab, and mepolizumab. Um, so, um, and then you avoid aspirin or any cross-reacting NSAIDs to avoid a reaction if they're not desensitized. Um, they usually do tolerate acetaminophen or um, paracetamol um, doses for less than at less than a thousand milligrams. Um, greater than a thousand milligrams, they do have kind of increased risk of reaction to these. Um, and then they typically do um, tolerate selective COX two inhibitors well. So um, I really liked this slide. So this was um, from the college meeting. Um, so, um, Dr. Stevens um, uh, gave us kind of, was one of the presenters in the lecture that we went to on AERD, and um, I just liked this slide a lot, so um, um, have included it on here to kind of further, um, further just talk about, um, it just depicts that 
in asthma, you have your um, treatment plan that's usually your inhaled steroids and LABAs and um, your, um, your leukotriene antagonists. And then you have your chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis treatment, which is primarily your, um, your steroids intranasally. And then for your intolerance to COX-1 inhibitors, you've got your avoidance, um, primarily avoidance. But then, um, so you have your overlap between your asthma and your chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, and then you've got sinus surgery and um, oral steroids, and then your um, biologics. But then um, aspirin desensitization and daily maintenance therapy is the only one that um, helps all three of those things. So talking a little bit more about desensitization, so um, several protocols exist, and it is similar to the challenge protocols um, that we talked about a little bit ago, um, where you give incrementally, incrementally increasing doses to achieve that target cumulative dose of aspirin. Um, difference with this is that you, um, you keep on your medications. Um, you want to um, be well controlled in the, um, with their asthma ahead of time. Um, especially so you have your, um, you do um, keep them on their ICS or LABA to ensure ongoing um, stability of disease. Um, and then um, they do actually recommend starting um, a leukotriene receptor antagonist like, um, like Montelukast um, at least three days prior to the procedure. Um, and then typically prior to aspirin desensitization, they do recommend surgical debulking of polyps if they have their significant polypoid disease. And it's usually at least four to six weeks prior to desensitization to aspirin. Um, monitoring is the same as during a challenge. So with FEV1, um, having your equipment available and not, um, obviously taking lots of vitals. So um, reactions during aspirin desensitization typically occur at lower doses, um, so around the 40 milligram mark-ish area. Um, and most commonly, the reactions are upper airway, more um, nasal symptoms or ocular symptoms. Um, and then um, still frequent but less common, you have your bronchial reactions where you have your drop in your FEV1 and then um, followed by GI cutaneous and then laryngeal symptoms. So um, the difference with desensitization is that you do you treat the reaction, but then you re continue on, so you repeat that eliciting dose, and then you continue to, de to continue to progress with your desensitization um, throughout that um, process. Um, versus in a challenge, you stop, you call it positive or negative, and you stop. Um, so, um, so you continue on unless you have an FEV1 that drops greater than or equal to 15% of their baseline for, um, for three hours or more. Then you end up stopping for the day and continuing the next day, um, which typically these protocols are um, one to two days-ish. So after they're desensitized, then um, they continue with daily treatment. Um, so um, they, it can be anywhere from 325 to 1300 milligrams of um, aspirin daily. Um, so um, we've kind of heard in the past that um, they don't, you do six, 650 BID um, or, um, or you can eventually drop it down, um, but they have to have daily aspirin therapy. Um, to continue to reduce upper and lower airway symptoms and to decrease the recurrence of the polyps, um, but, but it does not shrink any um, existing polyps. It's also been, um, been found to improve asthma control with decreased hospitalizations and systemic steroids. So following desensitization, um, patients can also, um, are also desensitized to cross-reacting COX-1 emitters. Um, as long as they continue to take at least 325 milligrams of aspirin daily with that. Uh, so if they wanted to take an ibuprofen or something like that, um, then they could take that as long as they continue to take their aspirin. So um, here is um, the list of kind of indications versus contraindications for desensitization. 
And um, and so the major indication is you know, persistent sinal nasal and asthma symptoms um, in a patient with AERD despite having your conventional medical um, and surgical therapies. But um, contraindications, so poorly controlled asthma, you have to have well-controlled asthma before you can start. Um, and then with a significant nasal polyp burden at the time, so um, that's why they typically, for lots of polyps, they recommend surgical debulking at least four to six weeks ahead of time pregnancy and then um, EOE um, with EOE um, there is a thought that it would um, there's a risk of worsening their GI symptoms on initiation of aspirin therapy um, but um, their kind of evidence is overall lacking for that um, and um, otherwise if you've got a history of peptic ulcer disease or um, uh, gastric ulcer disease, bleeding disorders, um, medication non-adherence, so have to be able to take your daily aspirin, um, and then if they've had, um, actually had a risk of anaphylaxis, um, so IgE-mediated um, reaction, then typically you would not um, proceed to go forward with it. So, um, as far as kind of the, the um, hot topic um, biologics kind of coming into play, then I'm um, thinking about whether to do aspirin desensitization or to do biologics or, or both, then, um, then some of the things you might think about um, are, and so for a biologic, if you can't, if the patient can't undergo aspirin desensitization, so if they do have that severe asthma that um, is difficult to get under control, um, their FEV1 is less than 70%, or if they have um, other coagulopathies or other of the contraindications to aspirin desensitization, um, then you would think about a biologic um, instead. Um, and then um, otherwise, if the patient has a comorbid atopic condition, such as, um, such as atopic dermatitis, that would also benefit um, from a biologic, then that might be um, a good option. Or if they can't undergo that um, deep bulking. Um, so um, for aspirin um, desensitization, you might consider that in patients that um, if it, it, it is just more, if they're able to undergo the debulking of their um, nasal polyps prior to the procedure, and then um, it helps to decrease regrowth of those polyps after surgery. And then um, if they require NSAIDs for another disease process, um, such as um, cardiovascular or pain management, um, then it is um, definitely more um, cost-effective and inexpensive to, um, to do aspirin desensitization. Although ultimately, as you, as you guys could see, it said shared decision-making all along the um, all along the borders there. So, um, so that's kind of the, also the, um, hot take of the, of the current medical era's uh, shared decision making. So, um, so yeah, that's something to, um, consider as well. Um, so, um, I also really liked this treatment algorithm that, um, we talked about that one of the lecturers, Dr. Laidlaw, um, gave at the um, conference as well. Um, I thought it was kind of nice just to kind of get um, her take on um, when to do aspirin desensitization and kind of timeline for these patients and versus when to consider a biologic. Um, and so kind of starting at the top there, if you have your symptoms are, um, are overall well controlled, um, then um, you can go down to um, just um, overall symptoms are well controlled, you've got your asthma is controlled, and you don't have just a bunch of nasal polyps that need surgery, um, then you can do your aspirin desensitization um, and continue on high-dose aspirin to help prevent regrowth or uh, nasal polyp growth, excuse me. Um, and then, um, then you also, in addition to aspirin desensitization, continue on your topical steroids, sinus irrigations, and then your daily aspirin. Um, and um, they do um, recommend reviewing kind of with these patients every three to six months to see how they're doing. If there is um, nasal polyp reoccurrence, then they would initiate a biologic after, the, um, after they've had the aspirin desensitization. Um, but then, um, and then they would also continue, consider, excuse me, consider a biologic after aspirin desensitization if their asthma is just not very well controlled still. 
So um, otherwise, if their um, symptoms were not, kind of going back to the top, if their symptoms were not sufficiently controlled, um, then they would um, they would do um, continue with their medical therapy and then um, review again in about three months. And then if there's improvement with their um, baseline medical therapy, then they would re they would consider doing aspirin desensitization versus if there wasn't sufficient improvement of their nasal polyps um, during that time um, or if they're asthma during that time, then they would do um, kind of your sinus surgeries to debulk. Um, debulk those nasal polyps, um, and then you continue on your sinus irrigations, topical steroids, and then you continue to review every one to three months. But I thought this was just a nice reference um, to kind of go back to, at least kind of when you're trying to figure out um, where you're at in the process. So um, that was NERD, or AERD. Um, so now kind of moving on to NSAID exacerbated cutaneous disease. So um, this is um, also considered to be type 2, um, and so with this, NSAIDs are actually um, one of the more common causes of drug-induced urticaria, um, and that's in patients um, both with and without um, history of chronic urticaria and angioedema. Um, but um, so in these patients with um, NSAID exacerbated cutaneous disease, so they have worsening urticaria and angioedema occurring within the 30 minutes all the way up to 6 hours. Um, following your NSAID ingestion, and that's in patients that already have chronic underlying urticaria. The urticaria um, is typically more, it can be localized, it can be generalized, um, but then the angioedema is usually a more central um, facial and periorbital. So um, otherwise, um, the NSAIDs typically exacerbate urticaria in those that um, uh, kind of, as we talked about, already have chronic um, idiopathic urticaria or, um, or it can happen in um, those with cholinergic urticaria as well. Um, it's typically more significant in those that have uncontrolled underlying urticaria and then have active, um, active disease. So um, it does occur in, um, more than, with more than one group of chemically unrelated NSAIDs and is typically dose-dependent. Oftentimes, these patients will um, typically also be more triggered by um, stress, alcohol, ingestion, um, infection, and then tri physical triggers as well. So, um, continuing on, so if they're, um, as far as diagnosis goes, um, then if there is unclear history of cross-reactivity to multiple N classes of NSAIDs or if um, the diagnosis is in question, then um, you can perform a kind of an oral challenge um, to the culprit drug um, that was taken if you need to kind of confirm a reaction if the history wasn't um, super clear. Um, or it can be to um, aspirin to confirm if it's... Um, the cross-reactive type um, of NSAID reaction um, specifically related to COX-1 inhibition. But overall, um, kind of again, it's a shared decision-making risk versus benefit discussion with um, deciding to do the oral challenge. Um, so um, you try to do the oral challenge um, if you can when the patients are um, have underlying um, urticaria that is actually um, well controlled at that point in time. Um, so there's no specific protocol for the challenge or oral provocation um, for these patients, but um, there have been several that have been proposed, um, um, not completely dissimilar to kind of what we do for our challenges otherwise um, for drugs. So you start at kind of at the one-tenth of the dose is your first dose, and then you can give increasing doses every one to two hours um, until you reach that full, um, full dose for that medication or until symptoms occur and you stop. So, um, otherwise, for management, you want to um, avoid NSAIDs, um, specifically those that have strong COX-1 inhibition that are known to exacerbate their urticaria, um, but they typically can, call, can tolerate your selective COX-2 inhibitors, um, as well as um, acetaminophen less than 1,000 milligrams. But then, otherwise, you just continue their treatment for their underlying chronic urticaria as well. So, um, kind of moving on to NSAID induced urticaria and angioedema. So, this is considered to be type 3 NSAID um, hypersensitivity. 
So um, this is urticaria and angioedema that incurs in patients that don't have a history of underlying chronic spontaneous urticaria. And um, it's, um, it typically happens more quickly than, the, um, than those that have underlying urticaria, in which um, in these patients the reaction typically occurs um, within that first hour of drug um, administration. And um, kind of it does help to, um, their lack of underlying chronic urticaria does help distinguish it from NSAID exacerbated cutaneous disease. Um, and then it also occurs in, um, in response to kind of more than one group of chemically unrelated NSAIDs, um, typically those with strong COX-1 inhibition. Um, it is dose dependent, and the fact that it does occur, um, that the symptoms occur with more than one group of the chemically unrelated NSAIDs, um, as compared to just a single NSAID or um, NSAID class, helps to distinguish it from single NSAID-induced urticaria and angioedema. Um, diagnosis is primarily based on history. Um, but if for some reason, you know, if the reaction, um, the cross-reactivity is not clear, then you can perform, perform an oral provocation challenge um, to um, confirm or exclude the diagnosis. Um, typically, um, it's with aspirin as well. Um, otherwise, you avoid NSAIDs with strong COX-1 inhibition. Um, and again, they usually tolerate weak COX-1 or COX-2 inhibitors. So um, I kind of put these type 4 blended reactions um, kind of by themselves. Um, so these are um, technically called blended reactions and otherwise asymptomatic individuals. So um, these patients have a combination of um, both respiratory as well as cutaneous symptoms without any history of underlying disease such as urticaria or um, asthma or um, chronic rhinosinusitis. Um, so typically, there's a combination of some sort of upper airway um, symptoms. Usually, it's, you know, rhinitis or congestion. They can have um, lower airway symptoms, um, or they can have cutaneous symptoms as well um, after ingestion of strong COX-1 inhibitors. Um, again, it's cross-reactive, so it does um, occur in more than one group of chemically unrated NSAIDs. Um, so can kind of can look like the um, type six or the um, that single NSAID induced um, and anaphylaxis, excuse me, um, except for that it occurs with more than one group of NSAIDs as compared to um, the actual anaphylaxis IG mediated. It is just that one group of NSAIDs. Um, so um, it's kind of in its own category until um, there's more information on it. So um, then moving on to um, the IgE realm, um, so your single NSAID-induced urticaria angioedema or anaphylaxis. So, um, so single NSAID-induced urticaria angioedema is te technically type 5, and then you've got your um, single NSAID-induced anaphylaxis, which is type 6. Um, but um, they're often kind of lumped in um, kind of similar, similar groups with um, similar pathogenesis. So um, in, um, as compared to the cross-reactive type, these are um, non-cross-reactive, so only react to a single NSAID or NSAID class, um, and it's IgE-mediated instead of related to COX-1 inhibition. Um, so um, symptoms can range um, from mild urticaria and angioedema um, uh, to um, laryngeal edema and anaphylaxis. Um, it's typically faster timeline, so a couple minutes to a couple hours, but usually almost always within that first hour of ingestion of that single NSAID or um, more than, even more than one NSAID in a single class, but usually it's just a single NSAID. And then um, they do actually tolerate your chemically unrelated NSAIDs that um, are, um, since they're not cross-reactive. So um, diagnosis is usually based on history. Um, so you've got your immediate symptoms, tolerate other classes of NSAIDs, and no, no um, history of underlying urticaria. Um, so if you have, um, if, if cross-reactivity is uncertain, then you can do an oral challenge to your chemically unrelated NSAIDs, um, so preferably um, aspirin. So um, specific IgE testing, so skin or serum IgE testing um, has not been validated, so it's not routinely performed. Um, and then um, otherwise they just avoid NSAIDs of that same structural class, but can usually take your chemically unrelated NSAIDs. So um, this was just a figure from Middleton to kind of go through um, the algorithm 
um, um, a little bit in a little bit more detail. So um, if you've got your, um, just to kind of reiterate, if you've got your um, history of a reaction to a single NSAID, then you um, need to make sure, is it to a single NSAID or is it um, to multiple NSAIDs to help determine if it's um, the cross-reactive type versus not cross-reactive type. Um, and um, so typically you would challenge with, um, typically with um, aspirin um, most of the time. Um, and then um, otherwise, if you already have a known history of reaction to multiple NSAIDs, then um, you, um, you can confirm it with, um, with a COX-1 inhibitor um, challenge, so with aspirin. And then if it's positive, um, sometimes they, they do say to go ahead and um, if you're going to prescribe a, a non-COX-1 inhibitor, such as a COX-2 inhibitor, um, then um, you can um, do an oral challenge in clinic, um, especially if there's patient or provider concern that they um, may not tolerate it. So I'm going on to single NSAID induced um, delayed reactions. So um, these are delayed reactions to single NSAID um, and they are typically T cell mediated. Um, and as you guys kind of um, all know that um, you can have your maculopapular eruptions, contact derm, um, and then um, you can have fixed drug, drug eruptions, um, HEP, um, SJS or TEN, DRESS, or um, like organ specific like pneumonitis or um, nephritis. And then you can um, have your photosensitivity reactions with your allergic photocontact derm. Um, diagnosis primarily by history, um, and um, you can do patch testing for um, certain um, certain etiologies. So for um, contact dermatitis, um, or um, for fixed drug eruption. Um, if you do pursue patch testing for fixed drug eruption, then it has to be kind of over the area that the patch has to be placed over the area where the typical um, eruption occurs. And then you can do photo patch testing for the photoallergic reactions. Um, otherwise, you, um, you don't do drug provocation tests specifically in the severe cutaneous adverse reactions or the, those organ-specific reactions. So kind of going back to um, our patient, so um, just to kind of recap, so she had symptoms of kind of she had itchy mouth, itchy ears, itchy throat, um, so a little bit more subjective there, but then she did have lip swelling that was treated by a medical provider as well as hoarse voice, presumed laryngeal and geodema. Um, and so um, she, she had symptoms to multiple classes of um, NSAIDs that were chemically unrelated. So um, she had a reaction to ibuprofen, which is a propionic acid derivative, and then she had reactions to ketorolac and diclofenac, which are acetic acid derivatives. And then she did not have history of underlying asthma, rhinosinusitis, or chronic urticaria. So based on that, um, so we had concern for um, type 3, or NSAID-induced urticaria and angioedema of the cross-reactive type. Um, and so um, we said that she should avoid all NSAIDs with strong COX-1 inhibition, um, and, but that um, she could consider some highly selective COX-2 inhibitors in the future if she needed to, or um, acetaminophen, which we know that she had um, tolerated that. So kind of... Um, following up on her, so she's still having some knee pain, but um, followed in pain management clinic, and she hasn't um, decided to try the celecoxib um, yet, but she's taken her um, acetaminophen, and then she's also applying um, lidocaine patches. Um, she's other, otherwise avoiding her high-impact exercises and um, wearing her shoe cushions and is in physical therapy. So um, this was kind of the um, important concepts box that um, was in the Middleton's chapter for NSAID-induced hypersensitivity reactions. Um, so I'll let you guys kind of reiterate what we talked about, but um, I'll let you guys kind of review that. Um, otherwise, I did want to try to get to a couple of these review questions. Um, so again, these are just from the Middleton's chapter. Um, so the first question is, um, so what is the most common respiratory phenotype of NSAID hypersensitivity in adults? Is it A, COPD, B, chronic asthma, C, cystic fibrosis, or D, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis? Well, it's, you can put it in the chat or you can shout it out, whatever you guys want. <laughs> 
think Sonia said B. I was going to say the same. Oh, awesome. Nice. Sorry, Sonia, I didn't hear you. Um, she put it in the chat. Oh. Apparently my chat's not working either. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, I see it now. Sorry, Sonia. Um, okay. So, um, yes, B, chronic asthma is the most likely respiratory phenotype. Question two, um, what is the confirmative diagnostic method of aspirin-exacerbated respiratory disease? Um, basophil activation test, methylcholine bronchio challenge, um, allergy prick testing and intradermals, or oral provocation? D. Yay! Nice. Good. And uh, question three, chronic urticary patient with urticary exacerbation times two after taking ibuprofen or methanemic acid has lower probability of cross-reaction to... See? Yeah. And last one. Sorry, this one's kind of long. So who is a candidate for aspirin desensitization of these patients? I'd say A. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, here are my references. And yeah, otherwise, that is all I have.